So we've got lift from the keel in one side, perpendicular to the boat, lift in the other side, 10 degrees forward. They are just underwater wings and for once in the nautical world, lift is up. So, which is fantastic. So if the two boats are close enough, what's going to happen? Those two high pressures are going to repel each other. Whee! And we're gonna get something like that. So we can use it for coming into a berth. As he drives in, he can then stick it in reverse using the prop kick as the boat slows down, that will drag the stern round and bring the boat to parallel. Now, build keels have some fantastic qualities to them. Because they've got two keels and the keels are angled, when the boat is heeled over, one keel is vertical. Hi, I'm Tom. Uh, you might you might have come across me uh, from the instructor helpline. Um, I've been I've been an instructor for quite a while. I think it was uh, 2004 or something like that when I first uh, first got my yachtmaster cruising instructor. Uh, so it's been it's been quite a while. And I normally you'll find me on the help desk and answering your questions and marking your exams. So that's me. Okay, so we're going to be looking at how Bernoulli principle affects our boat handling. So Bernoulli's principle is with, basically is within a horizontal flow of fluid, points of higher fluid speed will have less pressure than points of slower fluid speed. So because of this, you've got kind of a, a very rough drawing of a uh, of a, an aeroplane wing um, moving through the air. As the wind goes over the top, it travels slightly further than the wind that goes underneath it. Because it goes further, it has to go faster. Faster, according to Bernoulli, um, it makes a, um, a low pressure or a relative low pressure. So from that relative low pressure, we create lift and that picks the aircraft off the ground and does its bits there. So we're gonna look at, we're not gonna look into aircraft because we're boaties, we're not, we're not pilots. So what we're gonna be looking at is how this is going to affect the underwater side of our boat. So liquid will also move in a similar way to air or gas or any, any of it. So it can be classed as a fluid, just like a gas can as well. So we're gonna look at how the high pressure or relative high pressure and low pressure on different sides of your boat can do different things, can move your boat in different ways. So the first three effects we're gonna look at are squat, bank effect and interaction. Um, you may have come across some of these, you may not have come across the terms, but you probably have come across, you might have felt it or so as you've been moving your boat through or past walls and things like that. Um, then we're going to have a quick little question and uh, Q&A on that bit. Then we're going to look at how it's going to affect small boat handling. So prop walk and rudders and keels. Um, that's it in a nutshell, really. So let's get cracking, I suppose. So high and low pressures. If we're going to look at that ship, you can clearly see as the boat is moving through the water, it pushes water, it makes a mound of water. That is a relative high pressure. The, uh, the water next to it is lower. So because it is lower down, it is a relative low pressure. So if you were to, if you were to plonk a little rubber duck, uh, you can see it in front of the yacht there, if you were to plonk a little rubber duck in the way of that ship, chances are it would not hit the bow. It would kind of bounce up and move off to the side because the high pressure, it would ride up the high pressure, then slowly fall away towards the low pressure. So we have our little rubber duck doing something like that. So that's kind of a rough idea of what's going on. So I'm sure you would have felt a bow wave. Have you ever been on the tube or anything like that? You can feel the train arrive long before it does arrive. You can feel the the bow wave coming towards you as it as the uh, train pushes its way through the tunnel. Um, if you stand too close to the edge of the train, you might get sucked in towards it. And that is because there is a relative low pressure just behind the relative high pressure of the bow of the train, if there was such a thing as a bow of a train. 
The next one is a picture of the back of my car. I've got a rear windscreen wiper on the back of my car, and that is all to do with Bernoulli, effectively. As my car through, moves through the air, it has a bow wave in front of it of air. If it's raining, if there was, if Bernoulli didn't exist, there would no no rain would land on the back of my windscreen, my back windscreen. But because of Bernoulli, or because of Bernoulli's effect, essentially. As my car moves through, there is a relative high pressure in front of it. Because of that, there is a void behind it or a low pressure behind it, which pulls the air into the back of the car and makes me have to turn my rear windscreen wiper on. OK, so let's have a look at interference. So we have two ships here, one refueling the other. Now, we have a high pressure at the bow. And if we look back a couple of slides at this, the sailboat, if you look, you can see there is a high pressure at the bow, then there's a low pressure, then there's another high pressure and another low pressure at the stern. And depending on the speed the boat is going, the more and more waves there will be. If any of you want to geek one out and want to find out the whole speed of a boat, it is directly uh, proportional to the, the length of the boat, because the longer the boat is, the quicker it can go until the wavelength becomes longer than the boat. We could put the formula for you. If you question me tomorrow, I'll give you the formula in the chat, in the live chat tomorrow, if, uh, if you really want to geek one out on that. It's great fun if you do want to. I did actually have a look to see if I could work out the whole speed of my car to work out what uh, what's the best speed to get the wind, uh, to get the rain on the back windscreen. Um, it was uh, eight miles an hour, I worked it out. Okay, so we've got interference back to this one, sorry. So we have a high pressure, then there will be a low pressure on a ship of this sort of size. There'll be lots of highs and lows all the way down the length of it. But if you're going to drive a boat alongside it or overtake your boat as it comes towards it, you're going to end up with two high pressures next to each other if they're close enough. So if the two boats are close enough, what's going to happen? Those two high pressures are going to repel each other Whee! And we're going to get something like that. God, isn't that good? Um, so boat B carries on overtaking and it gets to a point where it's not going to overtake and then stop there. Um, but what would happen is as you end up getting a high and a low pressure towards each other, they start to get drawn together. So you can end up crashing two boats into each other if you're just trying to run parallel. So the way to get away from that is make sure you're far enough apart. The low pressures and high pressures are relatively localized, so you don't find that you end up with too much interference if you've got a reasonable distance apart. Uh, and that, again, will be exactly proportional to the size of the boats and the speed that you're going in this. Okay, so squat. Essentially, as if, you, if you've got a ship moving through shallow water. So um, it's the same as if a ship was at anchor or on a mooring in shallow water with a tide running. So as the tide or the ship is moving, what's going to happen is the water is going to get pushed around the ship and it's going to get squeezed underneath it. So because of Bernoulli, la -di -la -di -la, that water as it goes under the ship will have to speed up. As it speeds up, lower pressure, lower pressure, ship sinks. It doesn't sh sink massively, not in the whole grand scheme of it, but it can be it can be a lot. So, I mean, it can be kind of two meters or so. Now, on a ship of this sort of size, two meters is neither here nor there. If you're, if you're only drawing a meter and a half, two meters is massive. But if you're only drawing a meter and a half, you're not going to be having that sort of size, that much of squat effect. So can we work this out? So we've now got lift going downwards. It's a bit confusing, the fact that lift is down, but it's essentially an aeroplane wing upside down. So the lift is the same term, it's the same effect, it's the same everything, it's just upside down. This can be an issue if you're running across a contour or cross, kind of, if you're running along a, uh, a, a ridge and it's deeper on one side of your boat than it is on the other. Now, for a boat that's 
that most of us will be playing with it's going to be kind of three meters four meters even in a catamaran at six meters or seven um it's neither here nor there but a container ship like this where they're 30 40 60 meters wide that's kind of noticeable and you can have a big difference between the port and the starboard or port and starboard so what can end up happening is it can create a bit of a list because one side the Bernoulli effect is stronger than it is on the other side now this is just going to create an issue it's going to make it slightly harder because the ship isn't going to be efficient or as efficient one propeller is deeper than the other propeller in this particular instance also one side of the ship has more wetted area than the other side of the ship so one side has more drag than the other side so it's going to this particular ship is going to want to constantly turn to starboard and in order to counteract that you've got to leave your rudder ever so slightly off to port so you're going to be dragging your rudder through the water sideways which is not ideal so but it's one of those things it does happen and it's certainly not uncommon so the next one we're going to look at is the qe2 and the oasis of the seas now the qe2 i don't know if any of you guys remember back in 1991 she ran aground it was an uncharted set of rocks. She hit the bottom twice, quick succession. So 91, it's over in Martha's Vineyard. So the chart datum, once it was, once it was worked out, was 35 foot. Um, now the QE2 only draws 32, only draws 32 foot. So it should have been fine. It was two foot of tide as well on that particular day at that particular tide. So it should have had loads of room. In fact, due to squat it was pulled down by eight feet so you can any of you guys that have any sort of idea of maths will know very quickly that eight feet off that isn't enough now can we use this to help us that's the next question and the oasis of the seas did so the oasis of the seas enormous thing absolutely enormous thing air draft 72 meters which is just phenomenal it does have telescopic funnels so they pulled those down and in order to get under the bridge on the right there which is the great belt bridge in denmark it needed to well basically 72 meters down to 65 65 meters so it needed to knock seven meters off now just retracting its funnels it worked out that it could have 30 centimeters clearance but if they put the hammer down and went at full chat at 23 knots it could gain itself gain itself an extra 30 centimeters so it can be done and it can be used and it can be utilized if you know what you're doing and if you know your ship and you know your boat right okay so the next bit we're going to look at bank effect now bank effect this one is the one that we in small boats will come across so you can scale this right down to to canal boats if you like running down a, a nice little narrow canal now in general big ship driving down a driving down a, a canal or a narrow bit of water we drive on the right hand side of the road which is what coal regs say now the issue here is exactly the same issue that we have with squats but rather than it being under the boat and i'm sure in a narrow canal like this you're going to gain a bucket load of squats but we're going to have the same issue down the side of the boat as well so because there's only a small gap down one side of the boat and there's plenty on the other then what's going to happen is you're going to get drawn sideways towards the bank. Now, most of you guys should be able to work out that that is not an ideal situation. So as you're going along, what you're going to have to do is if you do feel that you're getting pulled in towards the bank, you need to then put your wheel away from the bank, which then sticks your stern towards it, which isn't isn't ideal. So the only way you can really get round this is by slowing down, taking your way off to a point where the suction towards the bank isn't quite as nasty. So as it moves forward, it gets pulled into the bank, the bow touches, stern swings out and we've got ourselves a block so yeah we should 
you should recognise some of this anyway. So this is the Evergreens Ever Given, which was 23rd of March, 2021. This is exactly what happens. Right, oh, the Rame Head. So I used to live down on the south coast, uh, down in uh, down in Gosport. The Rame Head, if any of you guys have been about in Portsmouth, kind of, 10, 15 years ago, or longer for a long, um, the rain head was mothballed there. Now, I used to use this. I used to do take day skipper students, hundreds and hundreds of them, through Portsmouth Harbour, and we used to use it as a night navigation exercise. Basically, what I used to do was I came up with some rubbish story about the captain of the rain head. She's a World War II Battle of the Atlantic ship. But yeah, I came up with some story that the captain was still on board and his ghost was still on board. And I used to say the story at exactly the same point, just where you could see the reflection in the bridge windows of the Spinnaker Tower and said, that reflection is the captain's eyes. And the amount of people that were scared stupid of this. And so what you can do is just drive really close, really close to it. And as you can drive really close, you'll feel that the captain is trying to draw you up against the side of the ship. And students, there were... Oh, they loved it. And yeah, sure enough, you could. You could feel that the boat was being pulled towards the ship. And all it was was bank effect. But as far as they're concerned, it's, yeah, it's a ghost. The rain head is, um, is haunted. It doesn't really apply to us out at sea. Um, this is all kind of close quarters and where you're close to the land, or at least close to something else that's hard. So anyway, we'll move on to small boat stuff. Right, so prop walk. How does it work? So again, Bernoulli, he came up with, well, he didn't come up with it, but he explained it anyway. So as the propeller spins through the water, it screws the boat forward, so however many. So if you have a 13-inch pitch prop, that means one rotation of your propeller will move the boat forward or move the propeller forward 13 inches. But this is with the assumption that the boat is, has no resistance in the water. Of course, it does have resistance in the water, so it's, it's not going to screw its way through quite like the thread of a bolt through a nut or anything like that. So there's going to be resistance about it. So in reality, as the propeller spins, the bottom of the propeller is in deeper water than the top of the propeller. So the water is at higher pressure at the bottom of the propeller than it is at the top. So this acts as a bit of a paddle wheel. So if the blades were at a zero in a zero inch prop, as in as the propeller spins, does one full turn, it doesn't move forward at all, it would just walk itself sideways like a cartwheel. So that's kind of the way that that works. As you put pitch into the propeller, it's obviously going to drive itself forward, but it still has that paddle wheel effect and it will take it off to one side. In an ideal world, the propeller would just drive you forwards, and if you put it in reverse, it would just drive you back. So we need to understand that and how that can affect us and how it can make our life easy and hard. So first off, how do you understand which way your propeller is turning? The easiest way is put it in gear and have a look. So here... We put it into reverse, so we tie our boat up against the dock, put it in reverse, and you should see the prop wash move come out the front of the boat somewhere, as long as your boat is tied up properly. And it won't come out evenly on both sides, so the way to do it is stick your boat in reverse, stand on the bow, and have a look which has got the most water movement on whichever side. And if, for instance, this boat here, it's on the starboard side, then that would mean that the prop in reverse wants to drag the boat to port. So that's what we tend to call port prop kick. We don't tend to say the prop, we don't tend to call the prop kick in forwards the same as we do in reverse, because normally, what happens is our propeller is now spinning forwards. The water will instantly go from the propeller and then it will hit the rudder and the rudder will tell the water where to go because that's what the rudder was designed to do. It's designed to direct the water and then turn our boat. So we don't really get too much prop kick in forwards. In reverse, 
We do because we haven't got that rudder, that directional rudder telling us what or where the boat, where the wash wants to go. So how can we utilize this for us? So for instance, if we want to turn our boat around in a very short space, we can use this. So we can put our boat in forward, leaving our rudder over to starboard on this particular instance. So we can just leave our boat hard over to starboard, put it in forwards. Now, you're just going to give a small blast in forwards. You don't actually want to move the boat forwards. Water will go, hit the rudder, and then that will push the boat off to port. Then stick it in reverse, turn it a few, turn the propeller a few times, get the paddle wheel going. You don't want the boat to move backwards. So you don't want to be going long enough that the boat moves backwards. Wheel spin, that drag the stern around back into forwards. And you can do this for as many times as it takes to get your boats all the way around. But you can do this without moving the boat backwards or forwards in its own block of water. And it works really well if you can utilize the wind as well. So if you start off with this and if the wind was coming from the uh, from the port bow, that would help really push the boat round for the good chunk of it to start off with. And then you're only doing the last bit kind of working against the wind there. So if you can utilize the wind as much as you can, then that's the way to do it. So that's kind of prop kick to a start off with really. And that's, we can use that quite a bit. So we can use it for coming into a berth if we know which way our prop does decide to kick. Drive into a berth on this particular one. This boat, this guy doesn't care about his boat. He's not putting any fenders out. Um, as he drives in, he can then stick it in reverse using the prop kick as the boat slows down that will drag the stern round and bring the boat to parallel which is exactly what you want so we can utilize this as long as we understand what it is we're doing with it it can hinder you massively if you tried the same trick as this but when coming alongside on a starboard side too with a port prop kick then it's just going to make your life a lot harder so know when you can use it and when not to use it and we're all good but we're using exactly the same principle the propeller has a high pressure on one side and a low pressure on the other and that is why how it can draw us forward it is essentially two wings or this one is you can have three four five of them just stuck to a central hub and they spin round and the propeller blades are wings um it's exactly the same or a sail however you want to call it I just assume that all propellers sort of turn clockwise. Uh, and no. Right-handed thread. So what's the benefit of sort of clockwise or anti-clockwise or like a left-hand thread? What's the proportion of um, right, so, uh, right, so, right, <laughs> so, uh, no, not all propellers do. If you have a wander around a boatyard, you'll find most stern drive motors will have two propellers on the same drive shaft, and they spin opposite direction in order to reduce the prop, sha uh, prop walk. Um, if you have twin engines, they will counteract. So they'll spin opposite directions to counteract your prop walk. So you have that. For general yachts, over the years, I've always gone, and it's not been too far off. If your engine is painted green, in reverse, you've got starboard prop kick. So Volvos. If it's red, you've got port prop kick, beta engines. Silver are also port, uh, which are Yanmar. Um, nannies are blue. They also kick to port. But it's down to the gearbox, so not all Volvos kick to starboard, not all beaters kick to port. It's down to the down to the gearbox that you bolt onto the back of it. But as a majority, if when I get onto a boat and I do the original wobble and I look at it and go, oh, it's a Volvo engine, I'm expecting a starboard prop kick. I will always check before I move the boat off the dock, I will always yeah, stick it in reverse, go and do that trick, go stand on the bow and see where the water's coming and go from there. I'll always do that, but uh, it's a mixed bag. There's no advantage. Okay, and then following on, does prop walk 
work differently with a sail drive? Ah, yes. Um, yes, it does. So when we look at rudders and things like that, um, shortly, some of the pictures have a propeller on it, uh, where you can see the you can see where the propeller is. But generally speaking, people that say that or people that have sail drive say they don't get prop kick. That's unfortunately that's a lie. You do get prop kick, but because your propeller is so far forward the prop kick is less pronounced the further aft your propeller is the more obvious it is so if you have a shaft drive generally speaking the propeller is much further towards the back of the boat and because of that it's got more moments it can it's got more leverage basically so when it does when it does kick it can drag it far easier yes yeah, just to say um in your example, where you use prop kick to, I think you turn the boat to starboard. Yeah. Um, would it be right in assuming that it's only you can only turn the boat in one direction, and that is the direction of your prop kick? So if it works to starboard, it wouldn't work to port doing the forward and reverse. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So if your prop if your prop kicks to port, then when you do when you do that trick turn to starboard if when your prop kicks to starboard do it to port yeah so it's it's just whichever way you can get it so that your stern will get dragged around as you uh, as you stick it in reverse uh, sure yes so if, if you're in a situation where prop walk is working against you and you want to min basically want to reverse as straight as possible are you better off gradually accelerating in reverse or should you just gun it hoping to get some speed and then use the rudder um right so what i would do here so for instance long keeled or any uh, long keels are are a pain in the neck for uh for prop kick because for two reasons one they have a very small rudder generally speaking and the other one is the propeller is so far back so if you want to reverse one of those and actually steer the direction you want to go what i would do is i would build your speed or build your propeller speed as quickly as you can so give it a short blast in reverse just to get the boat moving and you can have your wheel over doesn't matter it's going to make no difference which which way your wheel is pointing so i'd stick it midships to be perfectly honest the reason i'd stick it midships is because you're going to have less resistance getting the boat some sort of momentum backwards. Um, as soon as you have some momentum backwards, then stick your engine in neutral so your propeller is not spinning, and then your rudder, hopefully you'll have enough speed that your rudder will then be able to point the boat in the direction that you want to. So there'll be enough water moving over your rudder for it to, for it to work. So if you were to have port prop kick, what I would do is I turn my boat to port before I went into reverse. Because then when I do go into reverse, I can, knowing I'm going to get a load of port prop kick, hopefully, if I get it right, I've got enough port prop kick to then straighten me up by the time I've got enough way on and I go back into neutral that I can then reverse in the direction I want to. And if you can be slightly to starboard of your line, your original line when you start off. So because as you drive in, you're going to drive in one way, the reverse in, and then hopefully you should come down back down the line that you want to be on. If you start off to starboard, bit over to port and then come back every every boat's different so it's one of those that you'll have to practice but uh, uh that's where i would start with this kind of thing i'm just thinking if we've got any like brand new day skippers that are sitting here feeling a little bit overwhelmed there's nothing like boat handling practice to get this all figured out as there um oh no no absolutely step on a boat for the first time and and totally understand this like you say it's different from boat to boat so uh, it took years to understand half of this stuff. There's an awful lot to understand. If you do go on your comp crew course, if any of you guys are yet to do your comp crew course, ask ask about prop kick. I wouldn't worry too much about asking about squat or interference or any of those jazz, because in the whole grand scheme of it, for anyone that's in a sailboat, you're not going to have too much... You might feel a little bit of interference if you if your instructor decides to take you really close down the side of an old derelict warship. But 
in the whole grand scheme of it is you won't come across it too often but ask about prop kick and that will be a massive boost to any sort of boat handling that you come across and that you do and it will be if you can understand it from very early then wow it's going to be a big big leap ahead for you right so uh, moving away from propellers we're going to look at keels okay we have at the moment we've got wind moving across our sail we have relative slow wind on the inside relative fast wind on the outside creating lift sideways now it's as a general rule of thumb it's about perpendicular to the boom so if you look at where the boom is pointing stick it about 90 degrees and tip it ever so slightly forward so it's it's actually it's about 80 degrees is um is the the main part of the drive is 80 degrees off the boom but call it 90 degrees for ease of maths so if you're sailing like this boat is close to the wind that's kind of 80 degrees sideways that's really really rubbish sailing so what they did was they stuck a keel so like a like a thing on a bottom of a scale electrics car you stick that under the water that's going to create huge amounts of drag sideways it's like if you were to put your hand in a bucket of water and move it sideways there's plenty of resistance if you move it backwards and forwards dead easy so that's kind of the way that this works so we've got all this sideways movement now because we've got this sideways movement underneath we're going to have high pressure on one side of the keel we're going to have low pressure on the other side of the keel so we're now creating lift in the opposite direction so we've got lift in water from the sails in one direction and almost opposite in the bottom uh, that's essentially how it is if you get a bar of soap squeeze it you can either direct it up or downwards or whichever way by putting ever so slight amount of force angle one hand ever so slightly you can get it to shoot in the direction you want it to and that is essentially what we've got here so we've got lift from the keel in one side perpendicular to the boat lift in the other side 10 degrees forward from the beam so because of that we get forward motion which is ideal. It's exactly what we want. And actually, the effects of the keel almost, say almost, not completely, but almost negate all leeway. So rather than having 80 degrees of leeway, which is what we would have if we didn't have a keel, we can kind of get five, ten maybe, um, but small numbers of leeway which is ideal. It's exactly what we want. So let's have a look at some different kinds of keel and what we've got. So we've got one on the left. We have a long keel boat. You can see the propeller right at the back there. The rudder, actually really small. But because of this, because if any of you guys have ever sailed a long keeled boat, it's beautiful to sail because they just want to go straight because they've got so much area underneath that scale electrics track little bits in the scale electric because it's so long they really want to sail very very straight they're wonderful to sail and of course they feel very nice and they're really pretty so anyway uh next there we've got a bilge keel now bilge keels have some fantastic qualities to them because they've got two keels and the keels are angled when the boat is heeled over one keel is vertical the other keels are useless, other than the fact that it's got plenty writing moment to try and bring it back. But one keel is vertical. That keel is working absolute magic. So if you think about it, the more a keel is heeled over, the less lift it can create. So we now got a nice vertical keel. Fantastic. Great stuff. They are very short keels, generally speaking. So you don't get very much draft. Because of that, you can create quite a bit of leeway, just purely because it's only a small keel. If you had bilge keels with huge kind of six foot, eight foot keels, then that would be perfect. That'd be fantastic. But generally speaking, people buy bilge keelers because they want to go in shallow water and they want to do exactly what this fella's done on Close Encounter. Is um, He's 
parked it on the beach and it's far cheaper than getting a lift out if you want to scrub your bottom. So you can also see on close encounter as well where the propeller is. It's a long way back. OK, so we've now got other kinds of keels. So now we're looking at fin keels. There's very, very little weight in the actual keel part of it, in the wing part. All the weight is sent right down to the bottom in that bomb torpedo thing. These work really, really well. They're nice and deep. The deeper the keel, the more grip it has. Uh, don't forget the water is a lot thicker down there. So the deeper the water or the deeper the keel can be, the more grip it can have down there, which is great. So this is ideal. And because there's such so little wetted area, there's very little resistance to it. And if you look at that race boat on the right, I mean, look at that keel. There's absolutely nothing to it. Plenty of weight at the bottom, but absolutely nothing to it. So, yeah, that will really, really grip the water and keep you going nice and quick. This is a 40.7. If any of you guys are, are sailed at 40.7 when they came out of the factory, they had asymmetric keels, which were dumb. Most owners fared them so that they were symmetrical. But these were ace. Oh, they, they were great, fantastic boat, superb to sail when the when the keel had been fared, so it was symmetrical. But these things created lift. And these things created lift to port. So the reason for that is it helped bring the boat upright when the boat was heeling over, uh, leaning over to port. Um, so what it meant was it meant that you could actually point higher on a starboard tack than you could on a port tack. And it was fantastic on starboard tack because, wow, they really did go high. Port tack, they were dreadful until people sorted them out and then they were great on both tacks but 40.7s hey who would have thought asymmetric keels right keels and rudders so i said earlier ages ago about if you're in forward gear you don't tend to notice your prop kick so much if you have twin rudders like the one here on the left on gray lag the water that comes off that propeller isn't going to hit a rudder straight away. It's going to, chances are, go in between the two rudders. So you will notice that's a Pogo 36. They go like the clappers. The engines are tiny on them. But yeah, you won't really notice, or you will notice prop kick in forwards as well as reverse. So you do need to understand a little bit about what's going on. But these rudders, nice, short, perfectly fared so that they are very much like a wing. They will need very, very little boat speed in order for it to be able to pick up the water and turn it in the right, turn the boat in the right direction and get the rudders to work. This boat on the right, you can see this one here has got a, what's known as a skeg hung rudder. What that means is the water that hits the propeller, uh, the water that hits the rudder is already kind of split. So it already has a high and a low pressure before it reaches the rudder. Now, this has an advantage. It also has a disadvantage that, generally speaking, the rudders are quite small. But they, uh, the beauty about them is they're nice and protected. So you're not going to damage your rudder if you catch it on a lobster pot or something along those lines. But yeah, you do end up with quite small rudders with a keg with a skeg hung rudder, but also that leading edge of the rudder isn't quite as pronounced because the water is already split by the time it reaches it. Look at this, it's how a rudder works. So it's essentially it's another wing. How they work, you've got water coming in one way, it gets redirected, you create lift. Now we're creating lift. This is a rudder, it's also a wing, it's also a keel, it's also all sorts of things. Everything that we've been talking about, it's the same thing. So what about hydrofoils? They are wings as we know them. They are just underwater wings. And for once in the nautical world, lift is up. So, which is fantastic. That's absolutely superb. Because once you lift the boat out of the water, the wetted area, very, very little, so they suddenly accelerate and they go, they go plenty. They really do go like the clappers. And if you're sailing on lakes or in 
enclosed waters like the Solent or I suppose the Clyde or there's plenty of places out there in fjords or anything like that where you can get quite short, sharp, choppy water. If you've ever been in those sorts of waters, they're really demoralising because they stop you very, very quickly. Whereas this, ah, you just over the top of them, off you go. But they are wings in exactly the same way that everything that we've been talking about so far works. They just create lift upwards. Perfect. So how do foils work? As in the AC75GP things or wing foilers with little to no vertical keel in the water? Um, so uh, the little or no vertical keel. So the the ones that kind of come out of the top of the deck and kind of go round underneath try an AC7524 2B.12. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they're still create they're still creating lift in exactly the same way, but they're creating lift towards the hull. So generally speaking, what you end up with is uh, because they're stuck way out to one side. Um, so you can see to a certain degree that Omega one. Is that the type of thing we're talking about? Yeah. Or just any foil in general, how it works with no vertical. I understand that the keel, as you say, creates lift on one side with the with the wind going against the sail you create low pressure on one side of the sail that basically wants to pull the boat 80 degrees to one side yeah and the will resist that so there's a balance of forces going on there but it's if you haven't got that vertical in the water how does in that omega boat there stop going sideways um all right okay yeah i see see exactly where you're going with this they're actually a reasonable distance underwater it's not just in the top kind of foot of water or so. Uh, they are in a reasonable distance. And what they rely on, um, obviously, the, the quicker the boat goes, the higher it will float out of the water. But the higher it floats out of the water, the thinner the water. So the less lift it creates. So it will sink back down and it will find a very, very nice balance of where it wants to be for the right the right amount there is vertical in the water as well don't forget you've got it in the rudder as well so you do it you do end up with it they do suffer from leeway i'm not going to lie they don't point quite as well as other things uh they do suffer from leeway there is not the fact that they go so blooming quick kind of makes up for that so the quicker you go the more lift your vertical part of the keel creates so the more lift that creates, the more lift the sail creates, and you do end up negating most of it. Not all of it. There's very, very few that do. And obviously, the deeper the the deeper the wing, the thicker the water, the thicker the water, the more lift it creates, and so so forth. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks very much, Tom, for an excellent masterclass. I definitely learned a lot there. So thank you. Oh, so you're welcome. You yeah. yeah. If you've got any any more, I learned a lot making it. <laughs> if you've got any more questions for Tom, then uh, feel free to send them over on the live chat or on the email. Tom, you're back on live chat tomorrow, aren't you? I am. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you're, more, you're more than welcome to fire them over while Charlie's on the uh, live chat. <laughs> I think Tom's on all day tomorrow. So. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I think, I think that's Thank all you. Right. <laughs> bye, everybody. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay, Charlie, when the house bears about 270 degrees... ...to work out our distance from the lighthouse and use that. We might be perfectly on track, but if we're not on Let's time... Have a look. I've got my phone here at the effects it has on our steering compass. So our echo sound is working, we can find a contour and follow it nicely into port. Our left hand is pointing towards the centre of the lobe.